when I was in high school, I took a shop class. And the very first day of class, the teacher handed out an assignment. It was just one page and it had 20 items written on it. He handed out this white piece of paper, gave it to us all hands down, or face down, excuse me. And he said, this is, this is, a, this is an assignment, but it's also a little bit of a race, right? So finish this, make sure you do it right, but the first person who finishes wins. This is in high school, I don't remember what you won, but I remember them like, all right, let's do this. I'm, I'm gonna win this thing, this is gonna be good. And so the teacher says go, and, he flips, and I flip over the paper. The very first thing on the paper says, read all the instructions on this piece of paper before you move on to step two. And I'm thinking, cool, it's a race. No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going down through this, through this piece of paper. So the second question or instruction is something like, write down every odd number from one to 30. It's pretty benign, but it's pretty like random. So I'm like, okay, whatever. And then the, pr the questions start getting progressively less uh, like benign, I guess, for me personally. Uh, they, get, they start off with like maybe clap your hands three times, right? This is a quiet classroom, so clap your, that's, that's pretty disruptive. It's like, okay, weird. Uh, it gets down to like shout your name out, and I'm like, all right, I'm the first person to do this. All right, I'll shout my name out. Like, this feels very strange. And I get down to like towards the end, it's like take off your left shoe and put it on the table next to you. Uh, and I'm just like, mm, okay, cool. Question 20. Thank you for reading all these instructions ahead of time. Write your name in the top corner and sit there quietly. You finish the exercise, right? So I'm not feeling very good at this point. Uh, that, that's kind of a problem. But the whole point of this exercise, I think, from the teacher's perspective, is that this is shop class. There are things in here that can hurt you. The lesson is it's very important to read all the instructions carefully and follow them. Uh, so I, I, that's all I remember from that class. So I guess it was a pretty effective lesson. But I'm not talking about shop class, obviously. I'm talking about web browser stuff, because like Chad says, that's one of my side passions, right? I have other jobs in forensics, but my side go-to project always been stuff on web browsers. So it's kind of like my go-to thing. And this is probably the least uh, catchy title of a talk I've ever thought of, officially summarizing web browsing activity. But basically, I kind of want to talk about some things I learned as far as how you can use a summary and an overview to make things more efficient. So an overview can save time before an in-depth investigation. This is kind of like my premise is what I'm gonna try to convince you guys of during this presentation. Uh, so like back to my, my shop class example, if I had read all the instructions, it probably would have taken me 30 seconds. I would have finished the exercise instantly and, and skipped all that work and the embarrassment. But I didn't, so that, that's like a lesson to take to heart, I guess. Uh, and so I also wanted to kind of take a, a, before I start talking about this overview thing and why I think it's a good idea, uh, why would you want to save time? I mean, that's kind of like not a silly question, but it's something that, in, in my experience, I've had a, a range of forensic jobs. I started off as an intern at the FBI in an RCFL, so that's kind of one experience. I worked, moved on to working in small consulting forensic shops. I worked uh, at a SOC at a large healthcare organization, and then I worked for other consultants, like doing IR and forensics and things like that. So I've kind of seen the gamut, but it's still it's just my perspective. But from my perspective, you're getting, I've, I've been getting more and more devices that come in, right? And your same amount of time to do analysis is still fixed. So anything you can do to make yourself more efficient, I, I, I really latch onto that because it really helps me. And anecdotally, I've kind of heard the same. If you're like in law enforcement, these, these labs are getting more and more devices, these back, the backlogs are growing. Uh, and now if you're doing IR as like a consultant, you might be called on to a site to investigate 50,000 endpoints for something, right? You just can't do things the same way you used to. You need to be more efficient. And so that's why I want to kind of, this is all my perspective, my, my, my kind of uh, experience, but I want to gather some more evidence around this and ask people what their experiences were to get, get a broader understanding of this. So I put out a survey about investigating web browsers. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. Uh, some of you responded to it, so thank you very much. I very much appreciate that. Uh, but the survey was kind of targeted to, to this room, actually. Uh, I kind of promoted it on Twitter, on DFIR, which I think a lot of people here in the summit are active on. And I also put out a link on one of the SANS alumni mailing lists. Uh, so I think it should be kind of representative of, of the people that are here. And so I'm gonna be referencing some of the questions and answers from, from this survey throughout my presentation. I just think it's kind of gives some, some background and kind of water broadens the experience a little bit. So first question, how many devices do you investigate each month? Uh, I kind of had, put, I took two takes on this. The first part was how many devices do you investigate for any reason? And the next one was how many devices do you investigate specifically for, for browsers? So this was kind of 
to get an idea of like what percentage of thing of computers you look at, you look at web browsers on. Uh, so for, for all investigations, the the weighted average was around 14, and for uh, looking at web browsers, it was around nine. So around two thirds of cases, people look at information on web browsers. I think that's a good thing. I think web browsers are, are clutch in so many investigations. There's so many useful artifacts, and so often web browsers are the way that people access everything else kind of in their digital life. So I think web browsers are really a goldmine of information. So also on that is how many devices does each person have? Like when I start off my career, it, I think it'd be very typical. You just have one person, or if you're doing a case, you, you have one server or one computer, one laptop, and you do a dead, dead drive image, you use some forensics, and that's kind of it, right? But that's almost never the case nowadays, at least again in my experience. So I want to see what other people thought. Uh, not surprising uh, that the most common answer is one computer and one mobile. Uh, so again, everybody, that seems pretty representative, right? Everybody has a cell phone nowadays, everybody has a computer. So you're not, if you're looking, if it's getting someone's actions, you're not only looking at one thing, it's gonna very quickly multiply the scope of your investigation and if it can exponentially increase the amount of work you have with the amount of hard drive sizes that are kind of going up and up. I thought it was interesting that no one answered one mobile device. Like if you're investigating mobile devices, you're gonna have a truckload of them. Uh, this kind of reminds me of from, from Lee's presentation, like we expected the one laptop and then what you got, like all those other things. And that happens in lots of cases. So anything you can do to be effective and triage and get answers quickly or just qualify devices, I think can really help you accelerate your investigations. And then again, back to kind of putting a number on this stuff is how much time do you spend reviewing browser activity per device? So this was, I wanted to know how much time do, are you looking at the, that the, the analysis, not how much time your computer's cranking away at processing and whatever kind of spreadsheets you're putting out, but how much time are you actually looking and trying to use your brain to figure out and draw some kind of correlation from what happened. And again, not surprisingly, there are, there are pretty few sub 15 minute investigations. I think that'd be awesome, but I mean, that's, that's a really short time to get a really substantive answer on anything. The most common one, uh, was in this 15 minutes to one hour bucket and the weighted average was around 90 minutes. So if you look at a computer, look at your browser history for around 90 minutes, I think, again, that kind of jives with my, with my experience. And so if you, if you look at how many devices, how many people you investigate each month, how many devices you look at, how many devices each person has, how much time per device, like this is, this, grows, this can, can that turn out to be a large amount of time you're spending. And so even if you have some small kind of savings, I think it can help you out a lot. So this wasn't a survey question, but I was basically comp combining the results of two of the questions to try and find some insights. So this is the investigation time, how much time you spent looking at the evidence, versus the number of devices that you look at per month. And so I expected there to be kind of like a, almost like, like a line. So you'd have a lot of devices up in the top, in the top right corner for you guys. Like if you have very few devices, you spend lots of time digging on it. Uh, if you're more like in a sock scenario, if you've lost the device, if you're doing quick triages, you're looking for one particular thing, so, so they're very, very small. Uh, it didn't quite pan out that way to the extremes, but I think in general, it, it kind of follows that. And so it doesn't really matter where you are on this spectrum. I think anything we can do to help you move slightly to the left in this case, where you're using slightly less time per device, I think that'll help you kind of in, in the cumulative, cumulative savings. So enough about the uh, setting the stage for all the background stuff. So back to, an overview can save time before an in-depth investigation. So what should you put in this overview? The first thing that I think you should use is utilize visualizations to reveal trends and patterns. So visualizations, we're li really living in, a, in almost a golden age of visualizations. People that, for a, a, quite a while now, as you guys are all aware, more and more devices and, and apps and whatnot are collecting more and more information about you, and now people are starting to want to get access to their information. There's all these personal dashboards, all this kind of things that are kind of popping up as far as how to make really cool visualizations. Uh, the New York Times puts out some really good interactive visualizations on things to make their stories kind of more catchy. So there's lots of really good examples of visualizations out there to help uh, people get a good kind of handle on a big data set. And that's something where I think visualizations are very strong because they're, they're kind of, by definition, they, they kind of compress the data you're looking at. They, they don't, they have, you have to summarize things to fit it in a visualization. You can have a million row spreadsheet, but you fit it in a, in a three by three image if you want to. You're, not gonna, you're obviously gonna lose some information, but if you're trying to get an overview of the whole thing or kind of get your hands around the data, I think it's a really good way to do it. There's also this guy, uh, like, I, I guess he's my, like the grandfather of, of visualizations. His name was Edward Tufte, and he has written a number of books, and, and they're really awesome as far as visualizations. I, I kind of like visualizations for lots of reasons. But I'll just kind of flip through them, not even reading them sometimes, and just kind of go for inspiration for different ways to process information. So I, I, think, I think visualizations are awesome. 
So with that, uh, this is an open source tool that I'm releasing today. Uh, so it's called Synopsys. This is basically a proof of concept kind of tool uh, that just shows you some visualizations from, from browser history information. Uh, so this is from Exabeam, Exabeam Labs. This is our first open source uh, kind of tool. It's, it's basically cut in two parts. There's a small Python script that just processes some Chrome browser information that you point it to. And then there's a standalone, standalone web page where you uh, load the JSON file that the Python scripts generates, and then it shows these little graphs. So there's not, I mean, I'll be honest, there's not a lot of things in this, in, this, in this synopsis program that are super novel or groundbreaking. It's just showing you how you can use these visualization techniques to look at browser history. So I'm gonna drop, so the way synopsis works is there's all these little cards that are in this web page. So I'm gonna drop some of these cards in the presentation to show you some examples. And I'm also gonna pull in examples from other commercial or open source tools that do the same kind of thing because this by no means is, is a monopoly on visualizations for, for forensics. And there's lots of other open, there's also other tools out there that you can take the output and process it some way to make your own visualizations. So I'll talk about that in just, just a little bit. So just, this is more to get, get your uh, ideas going as far as how you can use visualization. So back to the survey. How do you find things of interest, right? Uh, what, I mean, I should shouldn't really be surprised, I guess. The most popular answer was a timeline, right? Forensic people love timelines. We want to timeline everything. Timeline all the things. Uh, but cool, but since we were doing that, we're timelining. We have millions and millions of rows in these timelines. And it's really hard to find that first spot. If you have a timestamp or some kind of known start and incident, you can use that to begin with. Cool, that makes sense. But if you don't, and even if you do, how do you get a hand, like you get your arms around this million, line, million lines of logs or, or whatever you're looking at, right? Timeline, you can look at it kind of in a macro view. Uh, this is from Synopsys, but again, this is definitely not something novel. Uh, you get an overview of how many events that happened each day. You can very quickly see spikes, you can see valleys, you can see periods of inactivity. You can almost kind of spot the weekends in there, right, where it drops down, this is from a work computer. So it just, it makes sense. Uh, this is from a commercial tool, right? Overview of time information. Uh, I'm actually not sure how old the screenshot is. It might look different, but yeah, there's a big timeline. You can click on it, you zoom into a smaller timeline, and then at the very bottom, there's actually just information that shows you kind of the records. So there's lots of different ways to approach using these kind of overview on timelines to make sure you don't get lost uh, in the details. So how often do you form each type of review? This is another survey question. And these slides will be posted, so you can kind of dig into this later if you're interested in that kind of thing. But the first two questions on here are basically, if you're looking at a small number of websites, the first one is solely looking at one website, and the second question is you're looking at a handful of websites. So for the first example, say it's a malware investigation or an IR kind of thing, and you have a, a, you have a, a known malicious URL. <coughs> so you just want to see how many devices access this URL. It's a very simple query. You want to know the answer, yes or no, and if it's not, then you don't care about the device. So knowing that one thing from the browser history can be extremely helpful. Uh, for the second one, if you want to know activity on a handful of websites, maybe you only care about stuff on Facebook uh, and Twitter, maybe you only care about social media kind of things. You, can, you just want to see those small bits of information. And then just in the bottom there, uh, the least common type of review was comprehensive line by line, right? I mean, that, that's awesome. Like, I, I would love to have time to do that, but you almost never have time I mean, there's some cases that warrant a super, super in-depth investigation, but it, realistically, it just doesn't really happen. So there's this thing, uh, like, so on those first two examples, we're talking about one or a handful of websites, right? And so that, for, that big overview doesn't really work because it kind of, it compresses information, right? The summary collapses all these variables down to one thing, just how many events per day. So why don't you just look at the same kind of overview, but just for a single domain, a single website, a single whatever you're interested in. So uh, Tufti, that guy I was talking about, he has this idea called sparklines. So sparklines are these little graphs that you can uh, embed almost like in a paragraph if you wanted. The, the point is that they're one dimensional, they show one thing, so you just kind of get a feel for what's going on. Like it might take a paragraph to describe, oh, there was high activity then, it was low activity here. Or if you just draw a little line that's squiggly on that shows it, you kind of get the same answer much more quickly. So I'm calling this domain sparks uh, instead of a spark line. So it's just you look at one domain, see the activity. This happens to be the website from that I used for read RSS feeds. And so for, apparently for some reason, some gap there, I didn't look at it at all. If, if, if this was an investigation and I was cared about this website on this time period, if I see there's a gap right here and that's when I knew it happened, 
I could immediately, not immediately, but I could potentially discard this device and not look at it further. Uh, if it's the only device I had, it could be a very big clue that I don't have all the devices I need that are relevant for the investigation, so you can go out and find more devices. The other thing with the, that Tufties says is another way of looking at visualizations, and it's called small multiples. So small multiples are where you have the same style of graph just shrink down, and you do the same thing multiple times, but with a different series of data. So you see in graphs, a lot of times, you'll have all the different series overlaid on each other, and so that, that's good for some situations. But I also find it useful if you separate them in these small multiples, and you can very easily kind of compare and contrast uh, what's going on. So again, you can't read the domains on this, but you can see very, it's very easy to use to see for relative periods of activity or inactivity uh, across the different sites. So these are all cards from Synopsys. The way it works in Synopsys is the top three domains you access by default populate these cards, through these sparks, but you can add them in that website box right there and, and delete them if you want by the clicking middle X on the site. So this is, again, if you have like some you know, bad.com you want to look for, type it in there. If there's no activity, then hmm, this didn't happen from, from this browser on this device. <clears throat> so, timelines are great, uh, but what if you don't want to look at your data linearly? What, what if you, you're trying to get a feel of kind of that pattern of life, like how this user typically does stuff when they go to work, when they leave, when they're looking at websites, what kind of breaks they take? Uh, the straight down million line timeline doesn't really work. So this is a heat map, and so this is kind of like a cyclical uh, view of it. So over here on the columns, we have the hours per day, so there's 23, and then the, the rows are each of the, the days of the week. So again, the intensity of the color in the heat map shows more actions on, on one particular uh, you know, grid coordinate than the other days. If you look on, if anybody uses Google Analytics, if you log into your Google Analytics dashboard, there's a very similar looking graph where it shows you how people visit your website. Like, this kind of stuff is useful for, for lots of things. <coughs> And in that, back to that, the, the question where it's asking how long you spend on investigations. When I was doing investigations, I would like to spend as much time as possible just because I kind of like web browsers. But I spent a lot of time trying to get a feel for what the person was doing, their kind of patterns. And that was kind of more of a, like the art, right? There's always art versus science and forensics. And doing things like this where you can quantify and actually put like data to things kind of moves us from the art to the science, which I think is, is where we kind of need to go to, to scale and be effective. And again, that's not, heat maps are not, not unique to this by any means. This is from Time Sketch. This is from their online, freely accessible demo. Uh, you can view a, a timeline, or you can click a button and change it to view different graphs and visualizations. So this one has a heat map. So this one, you can very quickly see, you know, Tuesday at 11, there's, if you care about browser stuff, this is when you should look. And all these summary techniques I'm talking about are specific to web browsers in this uh, presentation, but by no means are they only relevant for web browsers. Right, so in the top here in time sketch, I, I, my search is a uh, source short web history, anything that involves uh, web browsing records. You could easily change this to be failed logons or something like that. And the heat map would be just as effective at kind of finding when things normally happen, when they don't happen, uh, when there's outliers and whatnot. The last visualization I want to talk about is word clouds. I really like word clouds. Uh, you guys have probably seen word clouds on, on blogs, right? Tag clouds, those are pretty popular things. The, free, the size of the word is proportional to its frequency, so the bigger the word is, the more it appears. My very first SANS talk, I talked about, I, I showed an example of making a word cloud from everything in a person's browser history. It's just kind of an interesting thing, uh, and I found it really, really useful uh, ever since then. This is an example made from the Python word cloud library. You just put in a block of text and it generates a thing. This is actually even just the default colors and values, so whatever. But this was taken from a user's URL, URL history. Right? So every URL they visited is kind of, it chops it up on the different words and bam. So you can kind of quickly get a feel for like, what is this person looking? Like maybe they're gonna quit their job, maybe they're thinking about resigning, maybe they wanna write a re resignation letter. Uh, so it's just, I think it's really good to get a, get a high level overview about what's going on uh, in some kind of set of evidence. So this is from uh, URLs. But you can use a word cloud with any kind of subset of data you want, any, any kind of data. This one is from autofill records, right? So if you type something in Chrome, it tries to help you remember the form field values that you put in. This is actually from a test, Im or the, one of the SANS images, I guess not the most recent one because Lee's talking about his, his new one. But I think it's kind of funny because you can actually see, he talked about some group, all they did is try to find out that Rob Lee made something. In, in autofill, you can actually see 
You know all the stuff about Donald Blake, but you can also see, you know, Lee in there, which I think is kind of funny. And then this one is uh, search engine queries. Right? Everybody loves search engine queries. If you pull out all the search all search terms, uh, you put it, you can kind of get a, a good feel for what a person was kind of thinking and looking at. Right? This is this is actually me from doing uh, research on building this thing and, and other stuff kind of in my general work life. So you can tell I'm doing some coding, looking at pandas, diagrams, dash, uh, plotly, things like that. So it's just a good way to get a high, high level overview. Next survey question was, how do you find these types of information? Or how often do you find these types of information, excuse me? So again, everybody wants to find that smoking gun, right? The explicit artifact, the proving their case. And you know, unsurprisingly, that, that doesn't happen every single time. You also might find some bad activity, but not what you're looking for. Again, that's pretty common. And most of the time, the very last one is only non-relevant data, nothing useful. That, 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 thankfully, for this survey, was the least common answer. But the third one there is supporting data. This isn't conclusive by itself, but it's really useful supporting information. This was found the most common out of any of these types of information, which makes sense. You can find lots of really useful, relevant stuff in web browsing history related to who, who a person is, what they do, uh, where they are, where they're going, things they buy, their interests. It, it's just really, really helpful. So supporting data is in web browsers a lot, right? Uh, and the nature of the supporting data is that it's pretty well understood if you know what you're looking for. So if you have common questions you're asking all the time in every single investigation, why not automate the way to answer it for you? Uh, this will vary on a case-by-case -case basis, and depending on what you find most interesting for you, but there's lots of, I think, things that are pretty common that people look for in a variety of investigations uh, regardless of the type. So what types of things do you look for? Again, first result, search engine queries. Again, not a surprise, and I'm very happy to see that. Search engine queries are amazing. There is so much information and better than them. We had a good talk from Phil last year about that. Uh, and search engine queries are pretty well known. We don't know what every single value does and how to decode every single other thing, but we know a lot of them. And we definitely know the basics, right? What's the search term here? Browser forensics, right? Very simple. So it's very easy, we understand how this is, so we can very easily automate the extraction of this kind of information. So in synopsis, in, in, in general life, I like to, I think I find pairing a word cloud and a table very helpful. You can look at the word cloud and kind of explore with your eyes, see things that look for things that look interesting, try to find the big trends, the small ones, and then you can use the table next to it to search and filter and find the timestamp when that search happened and the actual whole text of the query. I just find these two pair very well together. So these are included kind of in the default synopsis uh, dashboard overview. Back to that question. The next three answers, email accounts, cloud storage activity, and social media, they all kind of share in common the fact that you're looking for accounts that people have on services, right? In lots of cases I had uh, back when I was in consulting, you'd be interviewing some subject and they give you the two Gmail accounts they own, and then you want to follow up and say, like, okay, is there a hidden third one that they're not telling us about that they used to you know, send off some, some company IP or, or whatever? So getting information about accounts that a user has and they might have forgotten, uh, I think is a pretty common thing, at least in my, in my career. So again, we know how to do this. Uh, this is a thing that happens often. And so this is specific to Chrome. Uh, so there's three places that I go to, it's kind of like a go-to for extracting information about accounts people have. The first one for Chrome is pretty easy. There's a, there's a SQLite database that's expressly made for saving login credentials. So if you have accounts to things, it saves your username, your password, the domain. It's, it's super helpful. So we can parse that out and kind of put it in this cart. The second is autofill records. So autofill records record any type of information you store in a form, so kind of at a very high level. And so it doesn't tell you what website that you logged into or anything, because the, the reason of autofill is to identify, tie the, the value with the form name so you can, it can suggest the same value to you on a new website with a similarly named form. But you can use this to extract things that like email addresses. We know what email addresses look like. We have very good ways to automatically parse and tell if this is an email address or not. So you find somebody typing in a Gmail address a bunch of times in autofill, uh, there's a pretty high likelihood that they, they own that Gmail address, they have access to it somehow. So you use autofill for that. And the third one is you can automatically, you can, you can extract uh, accounts from browsing history. So there's some things uh, like Gmail, right? If you, if you log into Gmail, it has your, your email address, your Gmail address, and then a dash, and then Google Mail. 
So we, we know what that looks like. So if you're looking at browser history and you can see the title of a page, and it's on mail.google.com, you can extract the email address that they're used, they're logged into. So we, we can do those kind of basic extractions automatically. So we don't have to do it manually later. And so the last thing I want to talk about on this one is the at the very bottom, almost the very bottom there, is evidence of other owned devices. So that doesn't get a lot of, it's not a frequent investigation target. Uh, but I really would encourage you to kind of take a second thought about that and look at different evidence of ha having other devices. So back to kind of Lee's example and talking about in, even in the survey question, it's very, very common for people to have multiple devices. And, and app vendors know this, right? They want to make things as easy to use as possible, so they helpfully sync things back and forth all the time. So even if you don't have the device that the user performed the activity on, you might find evidence that was synced to it from another device. So having all the devices you can get your hands on from a user is really important. And there's some things you would think you, would, you could expect to find in browser history about other devices. And there's some stuff that I did not expect to find, which I thought was interesting. And I've kind of kept this presentation very high level. My other ones are more, more technical and browser stuff. But I'm going to take a little tangent, because I found something cool and I want to show you. Uh, so the first one, we have sync devices. This is uh, from this all specific to Chrome. If you log into Chrome with your, with your Google account or whatever your account, you can sync devices back and forth. There's, there's a synced out database. You can find lots of cool information there. But one of the easiest things you can find is the, the names of devices that uh, you have synced to. So here in the bottom, we have Ryan's iPad, X Ryan, and desktop. So that's, a, that's an iPad, a Mac, and a Windows computer. So you can tell I synced across these different kinds of devices. That's not breaking news. The, we, we, know, we know about that kind of stuff for a while. The other one uh, was new, at least to me. It's called Discover Devices. So this is a Chrome-specific artifact. So I was looking at this, uh, and I found some cool things in there. Like there's a, a Chromecast for our CFO's office at work with the IP address and the, and the names of networks. I, I didn't know he had that. I've never been in his office. Uh, and there's a couple other uh, devices on there, Google Home. What? What is, what is this? So there's this thing called the Media Router extension. It's built into Chrome by default. Uh, and it's hidden in the fact that you can't, if you open up the extensions, you're not going to see Media Router in there. But it, but it, it is there. Uh, and that very long string starting with PCAD is the app ID for the Media Router. And it's so like a lot of Chrome extensions, the Media Router stores some information in local storage. So if you look in local storage for that app ID, you'll find a lot of information. One of the more useful ones I found is called Sync Map, I think. And so I guess I'll back up a minute. The reason this Media Router extension exists is so you can helpfully Chromecast, or you can cast anything you want from Chrome to any cast supportable devices. So the screenshot on the left, I'm trying to cast this website to my TV. So it cast to, it found the TV icon, and it's populating it. So cool, it, it automatically found that I have a TV that can support uh, casting. And over on the right is this record from local storage. It has the IP address of my TV, the name of my TV, the model of the TV, and something you can't see from this data, but the, the key above it is the name of the network that we're on. So you can actually find local devices that are on the networks where your computer was from your web browsing history, regardless of whether if you've casted to it or not. Like, I've never cast anything to the CFO's Chromecast in, in, at my work or in that Google Home. I don't know whose that is. Uh, but you can still see evidence of these devices, even in their IP address, uh, from your browser history. So that was pretty cool. I've never, never seen that before. All right, so done with the technical tangent. So this, this is at the end of my survey. I kind of wanted to also get a feel for who you're telling about your investigation, right? Nobody does these investigations. Nobody does these investigations for fun. Oh yes, that's not true. I do it for fun. But you know what I mean. Like your your job, someone's hiring you. You're doing this for a reason. Uh, so what is the technical level of your audience? It doesn't matter how good your analysis is. If the person you're explaining it to it goes right over the head, they have no idea, you might as well have not even have done it. If they didn't understand it, then, then it was basically wasted effort. So sadly, but not surprisingly, the least common audience is someone that's like, like us, like, like a DFR professional that understands. You can use shorthand, you can just drop some crazy acronym and people know what it means. Uh, that, that's you know, not very common. So you really need to tailor your message to the kind of audience that you have in order to actually make an impact and have the effects of your investigation kind of be felt. So kind of pairing with this is how do you tell people, like the, the method? And the, most, the two most common answers to all this were either an internal or external report, written report, right? So people don't like writing, but I'm sorry, writing is an essential skill for, for our industry because if you, don't, if you can't write effectively, you can't communicate to your, to your audience, again, you might as well not have done it. But okay, why am I talking about this? Back to the overview. 
So this overview isn't just this thing that you should do at the beginning to save time to help you. I think it also, and then you gotta throw it away after you start your investigation. I think you can use an overview as a starting point for actually your writing your report. Right, these same images that you use to help find your first thread in your investigation or get an overview on a trend can be helpful for explaining that to another person. Uh, and I think pictures and visualizations are, are kind of more like a, a more universal language. Right? You, can you can show in a picture in the word cloud and people can look at it, even if they're not technical, and kind of get an idea about, oh, they're interested in this and less interested in this. It's something that people can very easily grasp. I think it kind of makes your report more accessible. It also breaks up your report, right? So it's not just entire paragraphs of text. You can have some, some catchy images to, to kind of draw people and not, not make them go to sleep. So I think the overview, uh, sorry, the overview, you can even include some of the information from like the, the, the extracted accounts, right? If that's all you wanted to know, like that your overview is your entire report. You just want to give me all the Gmail addresses this person owns, uh, check done, you saved, saved, saved a bunch of time. So there's a lot of really good reports out there uh, and visualizations are becoming more and more important in them. There's a lot of really good vendor reports like the DBIR uh, that have whole teams of people, it seems like they put these really cool graphics together, like an M trends, look, looks really great. But you don't need to have a whole professional team to, to make a, a visualization that helps you uh, in a report. There is this report that, uh, so I, I, was, I was excited about this for a few reasons. First off, not a lot of forensic reports are made public, right? Some are, but most of them are private because the person that commissioned them kind of had, it's sensitive, they don't keep it to themselves. So this is a publicly released uh, forensic report. I'm not really gonna try and say any of the names in them because this is from, from Norway and I would fail at saying them. Uh, but the gist of this investigation was a Norwegian newspaper got a hold of some log files from a streaming service and they went to a university, NTNU, to say, can you help us look at this? This looks odd, we think someone's monkeying, monkeying with the streaming records. And the short story answer, the short answer is yes, they were. Uh, but this report had a lot of math in it, a lot of stats. It could have easily been very, very dry and hard to understand, but I thought they made very effective use of visualizations. If you like that kind of stuff, like I would encourage you to read the whole report. It's 70 pages, but like 50 of it is tables, which you can skip, like tables of, yeah. So this is an example of visualization that is not very complicated, right? They, they got log sources from two separate days. And they could have just said, and they in fact did say in a paragraph, we got it from this date range and this date range. But they also show, included a visualization so you can very easily see where the data is, where there's a gap. It's just something that breaks up the report and it's very simple to do. There actually was a fifth month, but I truncated it so you can see the picture better. Uh, again, with the, with the investigation, so I'll give you the really short overview. They thought that a, some track plays were inflated to basically pay some people increased royalties at the expense of others for whatever unknown reason. And it was, I think, Kanye and Beyonce were these two albums that they thought they were inflating the tracks on. And this is from one particular day on the track counts for, I think, one of Kanye's albums. And again, you can very, they explain all this stuff in text, but you can very easily see there's something going on here, right? This is like every other track record like just is rounds to zero. It doesn't even exist anymore. And you can easily see that from the kind of records that the, like they got their point across with this, with this visualization. The other thing is if you look at this, like do you recognize this? Like I don't know if you look at Excel a lot, but I'm pretty sure this is from Excel, right? You don't need some fancy expensive software or some design team. You can do it with whatever you already have. It doesn't have to be flashy as long as you have the substance kind of right in the visualization. This is actually my favorite one from it. Uh, they got into the details of how the manipulation was done and they found that all these tracks were, there was this big multiple of three. Like people played three certain tracks more often, like three tracks and six tracks and nine tracks more than others. And they went through all this, this, this stats laws about how things decay kind of following this curve. And then they show you th this graph and so you can see all the, like each color is a day. And you can see there's only certain days where there's manipulation and it's, it's blindingly obvious, right? You can see things that look artificial and not natural at all. And so it's, I, I thought this was a very effective visualization. Again, looks like it's made, made in Excel. I got time, all right. Uh, so the last thing is writing guides, right? Uh, I said writing is very important. Visualizations are a good start for your report, but I don't think you can get away with just turning into visualization as your answer. If you can, cool, more power to you. But you're probably gonna have to write something. And one of my jobs, they, they issued this book to everyone that started, right? The Elements of Style. Uh, it's this tiny book, <coughs> excuse me. And it's a really good reference for how to, how to write things using active voice, all this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in writing and making your writing better, that's a really kind of deep dive on it. There's also a, another guide from one of the Sands instructors, Lenny. And it, this is the entire guide, it's one page. If you want the Cliff Notes version, go to, the, go to check this out, download it, and kind of keep your writing a little better. 
So yeah, so an overview can save time before your investigation. I would encourage you to use visualizations and kind of extract the things that you're always going to ask for. And you can also use it as a starting point for your final report. And I would encourage you to, to use this for next time you're, you're doing a web investigation. Right? Just look at this, pull the records, see what the visualizations tell you. I think a lot of times it's a really good place to start pulling on a thread and give you a new idea investigation that you wouldn't have thought of uh, initially. All right, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? All right, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.